everyone and glad that you have joined us this morning, especially if you're visiting for the first time. We have uh, every year as a staff, we have a, an annual planning session um, at the end of the year, usually around September, October. And we uh, have been praying at that time and leading up to that, what do we want to do next year? What uh, revivals do we want to have? What do we feel the Spirit of God is uh, wanting to do in the next year? And, and out of that comes the theme, you know, supernatural living in the last days. And out of that starts to come a lot of brainstorming. One of the things we really felt we wanted to look at this year uh, with the month of May being Mental Health Awareness Month is uh, why don't we spend some time on that subject uh, as a congregation. And so immediately we thought of uh, Brother Brandon Reed who's going to come uh, next weekend. He's going to be doing a concert right here in this auditorium Saturday night first class concert right here. Uh, as he does his concert, he ministers his testimony about uh, having battled with anxiety, OCD, how God helped him, how God healed him. So that's going to be Saturday night. You can, some, sometimes uh, you, you invite people to church. They won't go to church, but they come to a concert. So bring them to the concert, especially if you know people who are struggling in those areas. Uh, ec excellent music as well. And then he'll be ministering Sunday morning. And then we also thought it would be good to uh, have a mental health panel uh, with a mental finesse. And so Sunday night of next week, uh, we will be set up here on the stage uh, and uh, I'm going to be uh, asking them some of the most common questions that get asked uh, to them and some of the things they deal with most frequently. And what we're trying to do is just kind of help as many people as we possibly can. We're not going to deep dive into uh, anything really hardcore. We're just going to try to help as many people as possible. They uh, have been such a blessing to so many people in our congregation. But as I was praying about leading up to next weekend, uh, I really felt the nudging of the Holy Spirit to minister a couple of sermons that would lay the biblical foundation uh, for us to uh, sit next weekend on top of, if you will. In other words, uh, God began stirring my heart about some various minist uh, 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 subjects to minister on. And so uh, it's not going to be exhaustive. I'm going to preach this morning and then this evening I'm going to preach a message on dealing with depression. And then Wednesday night, God's answer for anxiety. The idea is this morning is kind of the big picture uh, of mental health. And then tonight, we're going to dive into uh, the second most uh, prevalent problem. And then uh, Wednesday will be the most prevalent problem when it comes to mental health, uh, according to researchers. And so uh, I'm not a, a professional proficient in, in uh, any of the uh, uh, psychological or uh, psychiatric arenas. I'm a pastor. So I view these things from the Word of God and through the Word of God. And what I have discovered in uh, reading and preparing for this is the world does a fabulous job shining a light on mental health concerns and problems. But then when it comes to solutions, they tend to fall short of complete healing. They have little things here and there and try this and do that. And uh, you know, while modern science and medicine have some very helpful aids, the medical and therapeutic alone is not capable of reaching the inner depths of the soul. When it comes to the church, things can also get complicated. Christians tend to place a spiritualized stigma on things they can't comprehend or things they haven't personally dealt with or gone through. And that makes them either ignore it altogether or take a very one-dimensional approach to healing. Uh, I read this last week an article uh, where uh, John MacArthur recently declared there's no such thing as mental illness. And in that article, he said there's no such thing as PTSD and no such thing as ADHD and OCD. And he called them all uh, noble lies that are being told and, and uh, they were made up, he says, to uh, medicate people and big pharma, the boogeyman is behind it all. And, uh, 
you know, I, I, I I'll say this after reading what he was saying. I do believe that society is overdiagnosed and overmedicated. Yes. I do agree with that reality. That doctors can be too quick to label things as illnesses and disorders. But to say that these things don't exist is irresponsible and it ignores the real and valid issues that fallen humanity faces. We live in a world that is broken by sin. A world that is spiritually separated from God and a world that is physically crushed by the weight of sin. And any time you have a combination of those two realities, there will be a detrimental effect on the mind. Our thoughts can get tangled up. They can get confused. And there are times we need help to gain clarity. And so what I will tell you this morning is whatever you want to label these struggles, even if you're not a fan of modern day terminology, I see most of these behavioral characteristics in various people throughout the word of God. They didn't have the name for it. They didn't have an official title for it. But you see the evidence of these behavioral characteristics all throughout the word of God. And we're going to examine some of the startling statistics more this evening. And just a, a little sneak peek, there's been a massive uptick in mental health issues since 2010. It has skyrocketed specifically since 2010. If you look at graphs of mental health, mental uh, illness, you will see that most of it is pretty much the same. In fact, between 2000 and 2010, it started to go down a little bit. And in 2010, it shoots up like a rocket in the amount of problems. And the greatest segment of society that has been affected by this is Gen Z. Which, which, to put it in uh, terms, the 12 to 28 year olds have been most affected by this. And, and here's my point. My point is that this is a much needed conversation for us to have as a church. I don't think the question is, are these things real? I think the bigger question is, where do they come from? What has contributed to their escalation and then the follow-up question would be, how do we view and handle our mental health in a biblical way? What I love about the Word of God is that we can find ourselves in it, no matter where we are in life. And we see the good and the bad and the ugly of humanity. We see how God brings healing. We get a first-hand account of how the great physician begins to bring healing to every aspect of life. And as Pastor Warner used the word, our great physician has a holistic approach when it comes to the healing of the mind. And what that means is that the, that the parts of the human beings are all interconnected. Meaning we are body, we are soul, and we are spirit. And what you do to one of those will affect the other two. You can't just treat one aspect. There has to be a holistic approach, meaning God will help us physically, mentally, and spiritually in order for there to be complete healing in our lives. God knows how he created us. And when we are broken, he knows how to put us back together. Now, for most of us, here this evening, we are not battling what the world might diagnose as mental illness, but we do have episodes in life. We do have episodes with anxiety, episodes with depression, and what the world wants to do is label them as disorders, as illness, as something you'll never be able to come out of, something you'll never quite become a victor over, that you're just going to become a victim of this disorder, that it's something that's so ingrained in you, you'll never be able to come out of it, wants to label you so that you can stay stuck under the slavery of that label and never experience true freedom in your life. But we have all had episodes in our lives where we struggle with maintaining our mental health. Times when things go too far, when we feel like we're losing it, that maybe our 
sanity is about to leave us. The world will try to medicate you, will try to enslave you to their practices, but God wants to set people free. God wants to bring complete healing. This is not always a quick fix. Many times it's through a process that the Bible calls renewing our minds. Now, before we examine this man's life this morning and the episode that he had, we, I want to put it in context of exactly whose life we are examining. Too many people dismiss the need to address mental health as, well, that's something for the weak. Or uh, they feel that's something that only happens to non-Christians. If you're not a believer, that, that's understandable why you might struggle with this. But let's, the, the subject we're going to examine this morning, his name is Elijah. Elijah was one of the greatest prophets of Israel before and after the episode we're going to look at this morning. Not only that, but Elijah made such an impression on the nation of Israel, he was revered as a hero. In fact, when Jesus came, a lot of people wondered if this was actually a return of Elijah. When you read, and Jesus is hanging on the cross, the people were wondering, is Elijah going to come and take him down from the cross? That's the man we're going to look at this morning. Elijah was on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus is being transfigured before man. His deity is being seen by Peter, uh, James, and John. And there is Jesus with Elijah and Moses. Exclusive company. That's the man we're going to talk about. And by the way, he never even died. God loved him so much, he's like, you know what, just come, you don't have to experience death. He just brought him up in a chariot, in a whirlwind, to be with him. That's the man that has the episode that we're about to look at this morning. A man that experienced a breakdown, who came to a time in his life when everything seemed hopeless, when life didn't seem worth living, his mind was affected, his body was affected, his spirit was affected, but God still helped him. And so let's begin by reading the breakdown, and then we're going to go back and fill in some gaps. 1 Kings 19, verse 1 through 4. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely... If by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid, ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. I think we actually do a disservice to the story of Elijah if we just look at this story in isolation because there was a lot that led up to this moment. In fact, uh, um, you understand when you work with people over a period of time or you just experience life over a period of time, people don't break down overnight. It's never just one event that just makes somebody shatter. It's one event, it's that final event that is is the straw that breaks the camel's back. It is that final piece of the dam that breaks and the whole structure breaks down. But up to that time, there's been many things accumulating in their minds and they are being crushed under the weight of this. And for Elijah, this episode we read about was actually the climax of three and a half years of chaos. For more than three years, Elijah experienced turmoil and uncertainty as his life was turned upside down, layer upon layer of transitions and stressful situations led to this episode. His story begins back in chapter 17 when he proclaims a drought in all Israel. He presents himself to King Ahab. He says, it's not going to rain until I say it's going to rain. 
Well, what that does is that makes him a fugitive <laughs> because now King Ahab begins searching for him, looking for him, and it also makes him uh, vulnerable, vulnerable because the same drought that's going to impact everybody else is going to impact him. And so God takes care of him. God says, I want you to go to the brook uh, uh, that, that uh, is east of the Jordan River, and uh, uh, you're going to drink from that brook, and then I'm going to command uh, uh, uber ravens to come every night and every morning uh, and deliver you food. They're going to deliver you bread. Uh, they're going to deliver you meat, and you're going to be taken care of. And so, okay, well, that's, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're disheveled from where your, your life, your home, you have to transition from that place to a new New place, and now um, you're, 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 you're living by faith. Now, living by faith is a lot easier said than done. Every, every morning, he's got to wonder, do I need to save some of this, or the raven's going to come back tonight? You know, he's trusting God. We, we, we will trust God, but it's that weight. It's the weight of faith that, that can cause a little bit of mental strain, if you will. I know God's going to provide. I'm just not sure when or how he's going to provide. And so he's there, and he's at the brook, and while he's at the brook, uh, uh, all of a sudden he's noticing day after day uh, that his brook is starting to dry up. Now, you would think, God told me to come here, there might be an everlasting flow of water, that's why God wanted me in this specific place, but instead, day after day, he's watching the ravens come, he's watching his brook turn into a little stream, turn into a little uh, trickle, and, 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 and he's starting to get worried. It, it, what am I going to do when this runs out of water? And God intervenes, uh, and he tells him, I want you to go to this widow in Zarephath. I've commanded her to feed you there. And so, okay, uh, all right, I just want you to think about this. Let's not just read over this and gloss over this quickly. He is going to go and ask a widow for help. When the Bible tells us we're the ones supposed to be taking care of them. And now he's going to become a burden to a widow. That's not fun. Nobody likes to be a burden on other people. We try to avoid that. But now God's positioning him. He goes to this widow. And it's not just that. You might think to yourself, well, you know, if God's telling me to go to a widow, she must be a well-to-do, well-off, rich widow who's got all kinds of food. Instead, he goes and he finds out this woman actually has nothing left. She's gathering sticks when he finds her, and, uh, and he says, hey, uh, what are you doing? She's like, oh, I'm just gathering sticks. I'm gonna, I got a little flour, a little oil left to make my last meal, and then me and my son, we're going to die together. Got nothing left. It's like, <laughs> you know, okay, God, I, you sent me here to this one. Maybe I got the wrong widow. <laughs> And so, but you know, well, you know, okay, well, here's what I need you to do. Uh, just make me a little cake first before you go and die with your son. Just, just make me a cake first. And if you take care of me, then God will take care of you. And he says, thus saith the Lord, your oil and your flour will not run dry. And so this woman by faith goes uh, and she makes this cake. She brings it to Elijah. And uh, until the day it rained, that oil and that flour never dried. But again, he's living by faith as a burden on a widow, someone he's supposed to be relieving the burden from. He now is the burden on her. After some period, a period of time, Everything is good, but day after day, they're lifting up the flower pot, and okay, there's still some left. Pouring the oil, okay, there's still some left. And then all of a sudden, this woman's son that's been taking care of him gets really sick. He gets sick, and every day he gets sicker until he finally dies. So just imagine, you're Elijah, you've come to this woman, you're a burden on this woman. She had nothing. It's true she's only alive because you intervened in her life. But, but now, as she's been taking care of you, you've told her you take care of me. God's going to take care of you. And now all of a sudden, her son is dead. The same woman you told, if you take care of me, God's going to take care of you. 
Now her son dies, and it's not just that. Her son doesn't just die. She comes up to him, and she says, why have you come here to remind me of my sins and kill my son? And she puts the whole blame on him. All he's doing is following the will of God. All he's doing is following the orders and the word of God. And now he's struck with this and he's being blamed. Uh, uh, he's feeling the weight of this moment uh, and he's cry. You can hear it in his words. He cries out to God uh, and he says to God, God, really? <laughs> really, Lord, this is what it is? You brought me here, and now you're, you're, you're taking her son, God, and he cries out to God, and God resurrects this boy from the dead, and he brings this boy back to her mom. And she's like, now I know you're a man of God. Really? The oil and the flour weren't enough? <laughs> like, we've been living for years on oil and flour. You all died two years, and now I'm a man of God? I mean, I just want you to kind of see this this, this, I, this up and down lifestyle that Elijah was living, the chaotic mess that he was living for three and a half years. By the time we get to chapter 18, we're well into the third year of Elijah's chaos. And it opens with the words, after a long time, in the third year. So Elijah now is told by God, I want you to go present yourself to Ahab. When you get to Ahab, tell him it's going to uh, rain, that I'm finally going to send rain on the earth. And on his way, he runs into a man named Obadiah. Now, Obadiah is, the, according to the word of God, a man who, who fears the Lord. And this man has been actually secretly rescuing and hiding the prophets of God from Jezebel. Jezebel at this time is uh, killing all the prophets of God. And so she begins, uh, Obadiah begins hiding them. And, uh, and Elijah runs into Obadiah and he says, hey, go tell King Ahab uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that Elijah's here and he wants to talk to him. And Obadiah's like, come on, man. <laughs> like, don't do this to me, Elijah. I'm going to tell him you're here, and then you're just going to disappear and fly off somewhere. <laughs> and, and, and you're not going to be here, and then I'm going to get killed. He's like, hey, man, I'm just trying to do the will of God. Leave me out of this. You'll find an Ahab yourself, man. I'm just trying to do God's will. And he finally tells Obadiah, hey, listen, I'll, I will be here. I promise I'm going to present myself to Ahab. And so as soon as Ahab comes, and remember, Ahab has been looking for Elijah for three and a half years. And the first words out of Ahab's mouth is, you troubler of Israel. All the trouble that our nation has experienced is your fault. You are the cause of everything that has gone wrong in our nation, in our home, in our people. Now I'm saying all of this because it's important to live through the three and a half years that led up to Elijah's breakdown. If we're honest this morning, we understand that faith can be easier said than lived. We understand that trusting in God can add pressures at times to our lives when we're waiting on him and his timing is not the same as ours or he is forcing us to depend on others. I'm saying this because you also see that Elijah basically lived in isolation for more than three years, whether it was by the brook or with only two other people, the widow and her son, and you can feel the pain of loneliness in the words that he later speaks to God when he says, I alone am left. And you can look at that and go, ah, look at you, Elijah, aren't you? No, no, no. What he's saying is, I literally have been alone. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm by myself. And he's heard about Jezebel killing all the other prophets. It's very possible that he was so lonely and experienced such isolation that he thought, I actually am the only one of God left. That's how isolated he had become. He is isolated and loneliness and all of this in the process of following God and his word. It was his desire to follow God that brought him to this very difficult and lonely place. 
And finally, the day of the showdown comes on Mount Carmel in chapter 18. He summons all the people. Most of you know the story, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah. And he brings them together and he says, we're going to have a showdown. Your God versus my God. And you're going to call on your God and we're going to call on our God. And whatever God uh, answers by fire, that's the true God. And so Elijah lets them go first and they're trying. Uh, they're trying to call down fire. Nothing's happening. He starts taunting them, mocking them. Maybe your God's asleep. Uh, you should cry louder. And they're cutting themselves and they're dancing around. Uh, listen, you can't wake up a God that doesn't exist. And so they're doing all these things and trying to, uh, you know, hurting themselves, trying to get a, a, a non-existent God's attention. Uh, and finally, Elijah has enough. Uh, and and uh, the Bible says uh, that he rebuilds the altar. Uh, he uh, actually digs a trench around it. He arranges the wood. Uh, uh, he cuts the bull into pieces. Uh, he begins to add water onto the sacrifices uh, until the trench is full. Uh, he calls out to God. God answers by fire. Fire, and as a result, he takes all the prophets uh, and he slaughters them. He kills them all. Then he goes to Ahab and he says, he, he says, go tell Ahab that it's going to rain. And he goes and Ahab runs and he runs ahead of Ahab's chariot. Ahab is in a chariot and he runs ahead of Ahab's chariot. This is an incredible victory. It is three years in the making. It's the highlight of his life. This is the moment he was waiting for. For over three and a half years, he would have been thinking about this moment when the true God would be glorified. He would have been thinking about this moment and saying, man, once I preach that sermon after three and a half years and God's fire comes down, all of Israel's just going to bow down and repent and we're going to have nationwide revival and everything is going to change in the climate. This is not just complete victory for the God of Israel, but it's a vindication of his prophet. It's a verification of Elijah's ministry and relationship with God. And finally, after all this pain and suffering, all of his obedience, all of his patience, finally the nation of Israel is going to turn their hearts to the true God. But instead of that happening, instead of being rewarded, Elijah becomes targeted. He becomes the bad guy. And the Bible says in verse 1, Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Be because we know the background now, it should no longer be a mystery why a message from Jezebel sends Elijah running. And we know that there was a spiritual dimension to this, but the reality is that it landed on an emotionally exhausted heart. This was a legitimate threat. This was not an empty threat. She was already doing this to the other prophets uh, and killing them by the sword. But things didn't work out as he envisioned. I gave up three and a half years of my life for this. I made all those sacrifices for this. And now I'm the bad guy. Now I'm the target. I've been laying my life down for this nation. And now it's me who is under threat. And fear grips his heart, and this great man of God snaps, and he runs for his life. He begins to compound things even more by running to a place in the wilderness and then leaving his servant behind. And he goes further by himself in the wilderness, isolating himself even more. Was he ashamed? Was he embarrassed? He didn't want anyone to see him in failure. I don't know why he left his servant, but he just kept running and running and running as far away from people as possible. He sits under a bush and he prays that he might die. I've had enough, he says. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And he's so worn out 
that he just falls asleep. We are looking at a lot of stress and pressure, pressure compounded over a long period of time. You know, the symptoms that build up in our lives are not always visible to the naked eye. We can be so busy carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders, being strong for everyone else around us, that we can't even recognize that our own hearts are in such grave danger. This note from Jezebel was the straw that broke the camel's back. He was so emotionally charged in this moment that when things didn't work out the way he expected, he did not know how to process it. Elijah's having a physical and spiritual and mental breakdown. And the question is, what is God going to do with a man who can't hold his stuff together? Who loses it in this most critical moment in the history of his people? Is he going to write him off? Is he going to move on? You failed. I can no longer use you. Well, we know the character of our God. He doesn't do that. He says, all right, Elijah, you're broken. It's time to fix you. And we begin to see God's process of healing and restoration. And as we look into the story further, we see how God intervenes to help this man. It is my firm conviction this morning that at some point in our lives, we will all find ourselves having an episode similar to Elijah's. Struggling to keep ourselves together, struggling to sort through our thoughts, struggling to make sense of our situation, struggling to keep our heads above the water when it seems like life is trying to drown us, or even struggling to find a desire to keep on living when all hope seems lost. See, when something breaks in your mind, you can't put a Band-Aid on it. How do we keep our minds healthy to avoid these extreme highs and lows of life? How do we find the balance to stay closer to the middle where mental health lives? So many times we're so high and then we're so low and then we're so high and so low. How do we live like this? How do we, that middle line of stability, we need to try to stay as close to that as possible. There are a lot of lessons in our text, but we can learn how to manage our mental health, but we also learn how God heals us when we fail to manage it. So even though there's this mental and spiritual instability in Elijah, God doesn't start there, which is interesting to me because most logically you would think, well, he's having a spiritual and a mental breakdown, so let's deal with his thoughts, let's deal with his heart right now in this moment, but that's not what God does. How many of you know God created us? He knows how we work. He knows how he designed us, and it is telling that the very first thing God does for Elijah is he begins by addressing the physical needs in Elijah's life. Verse 5, then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And he looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again, and the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate, and he drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. You know, the simplicity of God's solution is so incredible, and it brings us great revelation. Here's what God is saying to Elijah. I cannot help you sort out your mind until we take care of your physical need. Now, because God understands that our physical bodies are connected to our minds, are connected to our spirit, uh, this man is tired and he's hungry. He's been fighting a long time and he's under a lot of pressure. And God says what this man needs is a good meal and some good sleep. A couple of times. Well, what about the, the mental? No, 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 no. He needs some good sleep and he needs a good meal. And he needs to do that a couple of times until we get him where he needs to be. Anyone who has ever struggled with sleeping for a period of time, 
you know how easily your mind breaks under extreme fatigue. You know how hard it is to sort through uh, the thoughts in your mind. You begin to think, uh, because you haven't slept for days, am I going, you can't even think straight. God's plan of healing and restoration begins in the most practical way. You need to eat and you need to sleep so that we can work on your spiritual and mental health because God knows everything is connected. You know, sometimes the start to the healing of your mind is going to begin in the most practical ways. It could be as simple as changing your diet, some exercise, getting the right amount of sleep. You know, these three things have all been connected in research, by research to people's mental health because the physical affects the mind. The other message that God is giving Elijah by doing this is he is saying, Elijah, I have more for you beyond this moment. You're stuck in this moment and you think this is the end. I'm telling you, Elijah, you need to eat and sleep because I have something in front of you that you need to be prepared for. I'm not just going to heal and get you physically for the place ready for the, what I'm going to have to deal with in your past, but you need to be strong and able to do what I'm calling you to do in the future. In other words, God is telling Elijah, I'm not through with you yet. If he's through with them and he's just going to let them die, why, why feed them and why make them sleep? Just let them sleep and never wake up. But God is saying, I am not finished with you, Elijah. The next thing God does for Elijah is he makes him vocalize his own thoughts. Verse 9, there he went into a cave and spent the night. Word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. He comes to Elijah, and he begins to speak to him, and he begins to ask him questions to examine his mind. What God is doing is he is getting Elijah and he is forcing him to face his thoughts. You know, questions are powerful. They make us ponder and put our thoughts into words. And sometimes the simple act of speaking what we have been thinking is helpful. I have counseled many people over the years and sometimes uh, I'll be counseling someone they're kind of stuck in their heads they'll say pastor I don't know what to do I'm not sure how to handle my situation uh, and so what do what do I do I do what pastor Warner taught me to do you start asking questions that's what God does so I'll just start asking questions and as I'm asking questions I'm I'm not allowing them just to sit there and cry over their situation I am making them vocalize what they have been thinking. I don't know what they've been thinking. I don't know what their thoughts are. And most of the time, they don't even know what their thoughts are. And the funniest thing happens is most of them already know what they're supposed to do. They already have the answer to what they're supposed to do. I've had, I had somebody sitting in my office a couple weeks ago, and he's sitting there, he's like, uh, Pastor, this is what I want to do. And he, he, he tells me the whole thing, and then he goes, you know what? That sounded a lot better in my head. <laughs> He's like, that sounds like a really stupid idea now that I say it out loud. <laughs> you know, you have to pull your thoughts from the dark recesses of your mind and bring them out into the light so you can examine exactly what they are. God is telling Elijah, you need to vocalize, you need to put your thoughts into words so that you can see what you're thinking, so that you're accountable for what you're thinking. And we can see that the fear that Elijah was facing, we can see how centered his thoughts had become on himself. I am the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. His world and vision had become very narrow and shallow. But watch what God does next. Because God needs to shake this man up and remind him who his God is. And how big his God is. How many of you know that in our heads, the bigger our problems get, the smaller our God gets? That's just, that's what happens. If we let our problems grow in our minds, it's like they begin to outweigh God himself. 
And all of a sudden, you can't even see God because your problem's so big, it's blocking your view of everything but your problem. Sometimes God has to snap us out of it by reminding us who he is. This is what he does for Elijah. Verse 11, the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. The noise and lies in Elijah's mind had become so exaggerated that God had to flex for a minute. He had to get his attention. Yeah, you know, I tell you what, when you're standing on a mountain and the wind starts going and rocks start shattering and falling all around you, <laughs> God's like, hey, uh, let me just remind you how small your problem actually is to me. <laughs> let, let me just, let me put you back in perspective. You're talking to me and let me remind you who I am. And he's shattering the mountain and the rocks with the wind. And then there's an earthquake and then there's a fire. And he's not in any of those things. He's just reminding Elijah, this is who I am. Remember who you're crying out to, Elijah. Remember who your God is. You're feeling so sorry for yourself. You're stuck in this problem, but you've forgotten who I am. My ability to deliver you and help you through this. God was not in all the noise. He was in the still, small, gentle whisper. When I ask you this morning, what is the noise in your life that you need to silence so you can hear his voice? The devil's a master at making noise and distracting us from God. He, he loves getting your mind to focus on anything other than your powerful God. And you are going to have to learn to silence all the noises of your life. You're going to have to learn to get in the word of God and discipline yourself to tune in, to listen for the voice of God. God's not going to scream over all your mess. You have to silence your mess so that you can hear his still small voice. His gentle whisper. After God gets Elijah's attention, Elijah comes out of the cave. He's very humbled now. He has a cloak over his face. He comes into the presence of God, the Bible says. We will never find complete healing outside of the presence of God. He comes into the presence of God, and God asks him the same question, and God gets the same answer. But this time, God begins to take his healing and restoration to the next level. And what he does for him is profound. He gives him a new mission. He gives Elijah a new assignment. He gives him something to do. You know when a, purpose, a person loses purpose and productivity, their minds begin to take a nosedive? We have to be here for something, folks. We have to be doing something. And when you're not productive and you don't feel like you have a purpose in life, then your mind starts to get away from you. And God is putting Elijah back together. And after all of these other things, he says, what I need to do is give Elijah a vision for his life and for his future. I'm not done with you. Here's what I want you to do. And the Bible says, the Lord said to him, go back the way you came. That's just good advice altogether. If you're in a bad place, turn around and retrace your steps to go back. <laughs> How did I get here? Why am I here? What decisions led me here? What things did I do that brought me to this place? He says, go back, Elijah, the same way you came. Retrace your steps and work your way back to that place where you came from. It's good to think, how did I get here? And then go to the desert of Damascus, he says, and when you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimish, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel, Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. You know, sometimes the greatest thing you can do is the next thing you can do. God begins to reveal to Elijah that he already has a plan for every problem he is facing. You know, God is Jehovah Jireh. 
He's already seen and he's already considered every problem you're going to face and he's already provided solutions for them. Elijah's looking at his future. I'm going to die. And God's like, no, I already took care of that. You're going to anoint this king and this king. They're going to take care of your enemies. And then you're going to anoint Elisha in your place. And what he's going to do is everyone that those kings don't kill, he's going to kill. Like, I'm already taking care of you, Elijah. You're stuck thinking you're a dead man. I'm telling you, I already provided to take care of all of your enemies for you. But the powerful thing about anointing Elisha to succeed Elijah is that this would require Elijah to pour himself into Elisha in discipleship. In other words, God gave him someone else to focus on besides himself. That's some good advice from God right there. That when I get stuck in my head, I need to stop focusing on myself and find somebody else to focus on. But it's not only that, uh, is it was also helping Elijah deal with this problem of isolation. So much mental health issues uh, begin and then they drive people to isolation. They become further and further isolated from God, from the things of God, from the people of God, until they're completely alone and the devil has them right where he wants them. And God says, I'm going to give you Elisha so you'll have a companion, someone to walk alongside with you, someone to help carry your load. And that's the beauty of the church. Galatians 6 to carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. There's only so much you can carry as an individual. And as a congregation, we are called to come together and carry one another's burdens. You know, the final thing that God does for Elijah is he begins to correct his hyperbolic thinking. You know, when we get emotional, everything is super exaggerated and our thoughts get so twisted. God begins to straighten out his thinking and he brings truth to sort out the lies that he has been believing. Verse 18 I have reserved, remember Elijah's lie that he had believed and embraced was I alone am left. And now at the end of his healing process, he's finally sorting through his thoughts. You see how the thought thing was the last thing he actually did? He dealt with them physically, he dealt with them spiritually, and now he's able to start renewing his mind. But it's the last thing he does. I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. By the way, Elijah, you're not alone. That's a lie you've been believing in your head. You're not the only one doing something for me. I've got seven, and not just two or three, I've got 7,000. Like you kind of miss, that's how big it is and that's how blind you are right now. I still have a plan. I still know what I'm doing. I'm still God, by the way. Even though you've lost control in this moment, I'm still in complete control. And this is how God brought healing and restoration to the mind and heart of Elijah. I want to ask you to bow your heads this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed for just a couple of minutes. Nobody looking around. We're going to go much deeper this evening into specifically the subject of depression. We can see how Elijah wrestled with this. We're going to leave Elijah and move on to another character because I want you to see it's more than just one character. It's more than just one episode. As we were thinking about the Mental Health Awareness Month, I thought, you know, that's something God is concerned about. That's why there's so many scriptures about your mind. That's why there's so much help with your mind. And even going into Wednesday, dealing with anxiety. Like I said, I'm not a professional, but I, I will tell you this morning, I have dealt with and struggled with episodes of these things in my own life. I have some, some stories I'm going to be sharing tonight and Wednesday night and some advice that I have received and Along the years, as Pastor Warner has helped guide me through some of these difficult things and pointed me to specific places in the Word of God and practices that I need to do in order to remain healthy. But while every head is bowed and every eye is closed this morning, maybe you've come here and you are 
not even spiritually in sync with God. You are not in relationship with God. That's the first order of business, I would tell you. You've got to get your heart right with God before God can help your mind. Because sin is the cause of all the problems we face in life. Sin breaks things. Sin is our disobedience against God. Sin is the reason why God had to send his only son Jesus to die on a cross as a sacrifice in our place. We deserve to be judged for our own sins. We deserve to die because of our sins, but God loved us so much that he provided a substitute in our place. The pure and precious and holy Lamb of God. The Bible says he was slain for the sins of the world. He died in our place so that we wouldn't have to be punished for our sins. And you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I'm not right with God. I have not repented of my sins. My life is not in sync with God. Oh, I think about him every once in a while. I, I do wink and nod every once in a while. I don't have a deep relationship with him. I've never asked him, never come to him as a sinner and said, God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. God, I'm asking you to forgive my sins. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose on the third day. And I want to put my faith and trust in him as a sacrifice in my place. I don't want to be punished for my sins. There's people here this morning, you've been, you've been punished your whole life by your sins. Your life is just taking nosedive after nosedive. And every time you think, I got it figured out now. I'm going to change this. I'm going to do that. And then you just break things more and more. All your great ideas end up just breaking things. You're tired. Say, so, Pastor, I just, I want to get right with God. I need to get spiritually in line with God. I've got a lot of problems, Pastor, but it, it begins here spiritually. While every head is bowed, every eye is closed, you say, Pastor, that's me. I'm not right with God, but I want to repent of my sins and get right with God this morning. If that's you, would you lift up your hand where I could see it all across this place? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Yes, many hands going up. Just lift them up quickly. Hold them up. God bless you, young man. Who else? Just lift them up. Lift them up. Yes. Yes. God bless you. God bless you. Yes, I see that hand. I see that hand. Who else? Just lift it up. You can put your hands down. Who else? Just lift it up. That's me. I haven't raised my hand yet, but I'm not right with God. I want to get right with God this morning. Just lift it up quickly all across this place. God is dealing with you. He's helping you. He's giving you hope in your heart. He's shining light in there. He's making you realize this is what you've been looking for. This is what you've been desiring. It's this moment right here and right now. You haven't lifted your hand, but you want to get right with God, just lift it up quickly. Yes, God bless you. Who else? Who else? Yes, God bless you over here. God bless you over here. Yes, who else? Just lift it up. You haven't already lifted your hand. You want to get right with God. Every single one of you, you lifted your hand. I want to do something. I want us to I want to be able to lead you in a prayer of repentance so that you can give your life to Jesus. If you lifted your hand, would you get out of your seat and come and meet me down here at the front? Just come, just come, just come. Come right here. Yes, there's others. You're coming over here. Amen. God bless you, man. God bless you. God's going to help you this morning. Just kneel down right here. Somebody's going to come and pray with you. There's others. You lifted your hands. Just come. Just come. Why don't you just make your way to the aisle. Come to the front. We want to pray with you. Lead you in a simple prayer of repentance. Maybe I didn't see your hand. Maybe you didn't even lift up your hand. But even now, it's like there's this hope swelling inside of you. Like, I need to do that. You know you need to respond right now. Just get out of your seat and come and find a place to pray here this morning. Their lives will never be the same. They're going to repent of their sins. And God is going to begin to give them hope uh, and restore their souls. Just come. There's others. You've been away from God. You walked away from God. And it's caused, it's plunged you into a darkness and despair. God wants to rescue you. He's reaching down his hand to pull you up. You come out of your seat and come and find a place to pray this morning. God bless you. Who else? There's more coming this morning. Don't be ashamed. Don't be worried. Almost every person in this place has come down to this altar at some point and surrendered their lives to Jesus. They're praying for you right now that you would respond. Don't be afraid. Have some courage and say, God, I need to do something. I need to make a move. Hallelujah. Church, I want us to take some time to pray this morning. 
God is so concerned about our mental health. He's got things for us to do. He's got, we're looking ahead at a, a world that is so broken. And I'm going to get into more of the details tonight, how broken our world is becoming. And, and what God needs is people, his people, to have a sound mind, as Pastor Warner said years ago, in an insane world. To be able to be a light and to bring hope to people that when all their thoughts are going crazy that you are thinking clearly and can lead them to the cross and can lead them to Christ and begin to help bring healing to their lives. There's people here to, uh, this morning, uh, your mind has been a mess. You've been all over the place. Uh, and even as I was ministering, uh, God was touching on things in your heart. That's the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to speak to you as an individual. There's things you need to give up to God and say, God, from this moment forward, I'm making some changes in my mind. I'm making some changes in my heart, I'm gonna order some things that I've allowed to get out of order. I'm gonna silence some things. They've been so loud. I've got so many distractions and so much noise. I can't even read the word of God and focus anymore. And I'm starting to think, uh, am I losing my mind? You're, you have problems you're trying to work through, but, but you're listening to all the wrong voices. You're listening to your coworkers and your friends and everything on social media and they're saying, try this and try that. Listen, you gotta silence all the noise and say, I need to hear from God. I need God to straighten my thinking out about my situation and my life right here and right now. These altars are open this morning. I want you to come and find a place to pray this morning as we sing this song and worship God. Let's find a place to pray. My heart to pray for something specific this morning. There are people here this morning, you have really struggled with your sleep lately. And um, it's been one of those things that's kind of caught you off guard. And uh, even as I was ministering, it's like, man, it's so practical uh, that it, God made Elijah sleep first. <laughs> there's people here this morning, I, 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 there's been an assault against, uh, I mean, specifically, I've talked to a number of people um, that are getting nightmares and waking up in hot sweats and just completely just drenched in because of these nightmares. Uh, but God wants to help some people that are having sleeping problems this morning. So if that's you, would you just come? Maybe you're still in your seat. Just come and I want you just to stand right here. We're going to pray for you uh, this morning. It's not going to be tons of people, but you're just, you've really been struggling. It's hard to go to sleep. And then when you do sleep, you're being woken up in the middle of the night by various things, and it's not the Holy Spirit asking you to pray. <laughs> it's a tormenting spirit. And um, man, if you, if you don't get sleep, I'm telling you, it messes the whole thing up. And uh, there's, some, there's some real practical things that you might need to do. I mean, you can, you can do practical research. I'm going to pray for you in a spiritual sense, but, you know, they, they'll say things like, Put your phone away an hour before you go to bed. Stop looking at the screens. You know, they'll do practical things like that. But what happens with, when you're having sleep problems is it, it compounds on top of each other because you can't sleep, so you're thinking the whole time, and then your thoughts make sure that you can't sleep, and it just keeps turning over, and then your thoughts just become, you're going in circles. God wants to help you spiritually this morning with your sleep. He wants to give you rest. God is a God of peace. He is a God of rest. He wants to help you this morning. He wants to just allow his spirit to just bring peace. There's a, some, some of you, it's a tormenting, emotional thing. There's, a, there's mind battles you're going through, and it's just like, but, but, but even recently, there's others here this morning, you don't normally battle with sleep problems. It just seems like recently, there's just been this assault against it. And, um, and we're gonna pray, we're gonna believe God to heal you, amen. Lift up your hands to Jesus. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you that I am your child. I come to you, Father. My mind is tormented. My sleep has been disrupted and I am asking you to give me rest. I break every demonic assault against my mind, my thoughts, my heart, my emotions. I surrender it all to you. I am asking you by the blood of your son Jesus to heal me, 
and cause your peace to guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship God in this place. Father, right now, I'm asking you, lose my right now, heart God. and God, my peace soul. Peace is all understanding. I give you control. Consume.